Soil School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by The Mosaic Company. Welcome to this episode of The Soil School here on Real Agriculture. We are down near Barrett, Minnesota, and pleased to be joined by Jody DeYoung Hughes of uh, the University of Minnesota talking about planting green, Jody, as uh, Farmers in, I would say, more central parts of uh, North America are using this practice. Northern growing areas, it seems to still be rather new when it comes to areas that grow row crops like soybeans and corn. Can you fill us in, maybe just to set the stage on what planting green looks like in this part of the world? Uh, Well, a farmer would put in a cover crop either while his primary crop was maturing and turning brown so sunlight's getting to the ground, or after uh, harvesting a short season crop. And they put down a cover crop. It will uh, die during the winter, but over winter. And then in the spring, it starts growing, and you plant your soybeans into it while it's green, so it's planting green. And that's what happened in this field behind us? Yes. So in the corn, it was corn before beans, and we couldn't get in there after harvest. So we went in with a drone and put down seed exactly where we wanted it. And then this year, we're terminating at different times. We're terminating either a week to two weeks before planting, the day of planting and a week or two weeks after and we're comparing that to his the farmer's regular tillage no rye cover crop at all and we're using rye because it's the only almost the only crop in minnesota that will overwinter okay what are the reasons for planting green like what are what are the potential benefits of this well one it, it can capture more carbon two we're looking at it as how much residue or how much biomass rye biomass do you need to uh, suffocate out the weeds and maybe do less herbicide passes. Uh, also looking at some of the diseases that go with it, uh, iron deficiency chlorosis and some of the root rots and some of the insects that may, is it a green bridge over from you know rye over into the beans? That one's not quite as important it, unless you're going to another uh, grass crop like corn. Then yeah, green bridge can be a real issue. And we're looking at uh, keeping the soil covered and building soil health, getting better soil structure. Another thing that it can do is for carbon. Uh, If you want to go into the carbon markets, going with um, planting green or no-till can be very beneficial and you can get paid for it. Mm -hmm. What about water infiltration? I know uh, we, in many areas, I would say where I come from at least, there's this mentality we need to till in the spring to dry out the soil and, and warm it up. How does that fit into uh, this idea of planting into a, into a growing rye crop in this example? Well, rye needs water to grow. And so it's, it's sucking up water from the soil and not just at your tillage depth. It's wherever the roots are. And, you know, and making that soil um, easier to traffic or get into the field earlier because, one, it has the roots that are acting like rebar in the soil. And the other thing it's doing is taking up moisture. So it's drying out the soil so it's easier to drive on without sinking. Mm-hmm. And you actually have a penetrometer in your hand here. Uh, what did we find in this plot when comparing the different treatments? Well, if you notice, we're right at the line here. And to the right, we have where we have done vertical till and no cover crop. And over to the left, we have where we terminated the cover crop the day of planting. And you can see there's a maturity difference here. And we're still figuring out some of our um, theories on this is that you know tillage does dry out the topsoil and it may have been just one extra stressor on this crop so it went into early maturing and this crop you know on this side didn't have that the other thing that we found that was pretty interesting even just one you know few months with rye in here is that it's easier to get the soil probe or shovel into the soil that has the rye versus the tilled plots so I know some farmers watching this will, will say, I already have a, have a crop in the ground. I'm a zero tiller. I, I leave the residue in the soil. How does planting green or planting this cover crop after harvest or just prior to harvest, how does that fit into to zero tiller? Or do you see this going into areas that have already been doing zero till? Or is this more of a, a practice that we could see adopted where we have t- traditional tillage in row crops? Well, um, I think farmers are if there's a will there's a way they'll make it work Uh, with no-till especially if they're just starting no-till cover crops can help build the soil structure faster so you get those benefits of no-till sooner than four to seven years down the line and I think that's helped uh, more farmers transition into no-till 
with full tillage, um, you know, any little change you can make. So let's say you're still going to chisel plow for your corn, but then you're going to drop down rye and plant green for beans. Even that, you know, that year of doing uh, more things for the soil counts. Now, yes, when you till, you're, you're going to undo some of those results. But during that time, you have something growing and you have the microbes in there that are, are feeding off of it. You have it, uh, the ability to slow down rain from when it, it doesn't hit the soil directly. It hits the rye. And uh, because raindrop splash, we don't give it a lot of credit, but it, it can move soil particles three to five feet. Okay. It can be very devastating. So would there be a reason for a zero tiller to implement planting green? Yeah, uh, if they want to uh, keep seeing those soil health benefits. Some of them too, because you don't do tillage, you end up with tire tracks maybe scattered across the field and cover crops are a good way of getting in there to break that up. What about grazing? How do livestock or cattle fit into uh, into this picture when it comes to planting green in uh, in these growing areas? Well, you can, if it if you do get a good catch in the fall with the rye, you can put cattle out on it and extend the their you know pasture season, and uh, they also you know deliver some manure for you. And I haven't seen too many people put them in the spring, but because you know then you can't get out their hoof prints and and the compaction they may cause. Uh, but after harvest of the soybeans, they can still come back in here again. Okay. Are there, you mentioned cows and the manure they leave behind, are there weed control considerations when it comes to, uh, especially I guess as we have more resistant weeds on uh, on our minds as well, is how does that relate to uh, fall cover cropping and, and planting into it? Well, I will say with the cattle, they do have a lot of weed seed in their manure and that you, you know, have to stay on top of uh, the herbicides and, and get rid of those weeds. So one of the things that I thought cover crops could really help with is smothering out the weeds and that maybe you can do one less pass and you know or maybe it will help them all germinate at the same time because you've got more of a consistent soil out there so you get a better kill a more effective kill um, also with diseases I, I'm really worried about resistance in weeds pests all of that and I think cover crops one they can build a more healthy soil so you got microbes working for you and they're taking care of parasites down in the the soil and then the upper the top part can help with weed management so there's potential benefits there as well yes but with cover crops I mean everything has a challenge right it depends on the weather you know what kind of cover you're going to get you need biomass to smother out those weeds and if it's only catching here and there but uh, at this field day that we're at, somebody was just mentioning that they're doing prescription herbicides. So you can take a drone up, you can see where you know your weed escapes are, and then you know put more product down in those areas. Mm-hmm. What do you hear from growers as the biggest obstacles or impediments to adopting cover crops and, and trying to plant into them in spring? It won't work here. It's too cold. Um, the cost, and also they may not have the equipment. So we've got to make it easy and where it can fit into something they're already doing out in the field. Any other thoughts then, Jody, on uh, on where we're headed when it comes to adopting planting green practices in, in northern growing areas? I think it can work. Um, some years it will... Some years you may not get the, the rye growth, but I, I, I think we're at the point where it's not going to hurt yield. And... We're also learning more like how much residue can you have out there, right? How much rye growth before you do start affecting your, your crop? And as we get better and better at that, yeah, it'll just be easier to implement it and give really good advice to farmers. And I guess that last point you made, uh, in a wet spring such as 2022 in, in this part of the world, uh, it was difficult to get into the field in time to probably, or in a timely fashion to, to control that rye? Yes, yeah. yes. Um, unless you want to fly on herbicide, which isn't, you know. Um, The other thing, too, is when then after it was raining, the tap cut off, right, for months. And we had the rye was dead then, and it is a mat that helps keep evaporation down. So there's a benefit right away as well. Mm -hmm. 
So there's lots, lots of trade-offs for farmers to consider when it comes to, to yeah. this practice. I, I wish it was one size fits all and that we could say, you do this, you'll get this. But Mother Nature can, yeah, she, she has the last word on that yeah. one. And that's probably a theme with all of your work when it comes to soil health. It's difficult to find one, one size fits all, but we kind of know the direction we want to go in. Well, true. And, and when we're talking about doing less tillage, and you, the average age of a Minnesota farmer is about 56. And does he have kids that are going to take over after him or somebody in the neighborhood he's going to sell to? Is he going to go buy a $250,000 strip tiller and start something new at this age? So we try to look at more, like, how can we be less aggressive with our tillage? How can we be not go as deep, uh, not be out there as many times and find ways to cut back on it? Because I, I doubt somebody in their 60s is going to buy a whole new line of equipment. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, thanks for your time and your insight into, uh, into the direction and, and some of these practices that farmers are looking at today, Jody. Yeah, thanks for visiting us.